All right, so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Joshua Teichman for joining us this evening. Uh, Dr. Teichman is um, in Toronto. He's on the U of T faculty in the part of ophthalmology, but also has uh, got an active practice at Chris Eye Institute, Trillium Health Partners, and is at TLC in Mississauga. And so I asked Josh to do a really interesting talk because this is something that I know uh, he has a lot of um, kind of interesting cases and good experience uh, with. And it's basically uh, what, what do we do when we're combining corneal surgery with other kinds of complex anterior segment surgery? You know, we often stage it, but sometimes we do combine these cases. And, and, and Josh has um, got good experience for the past, what, six years now, Josh, you've been out in practice. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we're lo looking forward to your, your talk, Josh. Hopefully it's going to be something that uh, is going to be fun for you to present to us. And as we mentioned, we, we can have uh, your talk and have questions at the end, but of course, if anybody in the audience wants to uh, send us uh, Q and A through the Q and A um, questions, we can always uh, interrupt Dr. Teichman's talk to ask him the question. So, but for, for the delay, Josh, thanks so much for agreeing to spend this time with us here. And as I mentioned before, this will be taped or recorded for our YouTube channel. So, thanks for agreeing to that. And uh, looking forward to your talk. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So, looking forward to give it. So, um, so when you, you when you asked me to give the talk, I, I was excited because this is something that I deal with a lot, and um, and I've given this talk uh, to our fellows, and and I've really tried to you know when I started uh, collecting stuff for this talk, I realized that there are really um, there are really certain things like ground rules, if you will, that I find if you follow. Um, the stuff goes way, way better. And so, um, so I'm just going to quickly show you my financial disclosures and a lot of this is going to be off label. And, um, and, and these are the ground rules that I came up with. And I think if you follow these, uh, you'll really save yourself a lot of headache. And so what I wanted to do is I want to present the ground rules, go through um, a couple of cases, and then, and then I've got mainly pictures. I decided to go with mainly pictures because I find video, even with the optimized settings, is sometimes choppy. I think I've only got one or two videos. And then, um, and then we'll, but we'll try to really do it in such a way that uh, you'll know exactly how to approach these cases. So these are my rules. And, uh, you know, no one loves it when someone gets up, puts up a slide, and then reads the whole slide. But I am going to read it with you so that, so that we do go over it. And so rule number one is always measure before you do anything else. And that, that holds true for corneal transplants, uh, of course, when we're measuring the size of the graft. But it also holds true when you're going to pre-place marking, uh, markings and you're, going to, and you're going to be putting IOLs or doing other uh, surgeries like suturing irises. So always measure first. Always block the eye if you're doing transcleral uh, passes. So I always, always, always do topical surgery, except when I'm doing things through the sclera, in which case that's when I do, a, I like to do a sub tenon block. I don't love retrobulbers, but they work just as well. That just happens to be my preference. If you are doing those two things, always make sure you try to keep the block posteriorly so it doesn't come around, disrupt the conjunctiva, which is going to disrupt where your marks are going to be for future suture placement or IOL work. Uh, I always use a flaringa ring when I'm doing a vitrectomized PK. I think most of us don't use flaringa rings anymore. I certainly almost never do. But if I have a vitrectomized eye, uh, I always use a flaringa ring. Uh, whenever you're going to, um, whenever you're going to use a flaringa ring, you have to make sure that you make your pyridomies if you're doing like a scleral sutured lens before you place the flaringa ring, or else you're going to be fighting with that. So it's one of these things where you can't just, you have, really have to pre-plan each step so because one step will affect the other. So it's sort of measure, block, flaringa, uh, pyridomies, flaringa ring. So you want, you want to have that order in your head and almost jot it down on the OR sheet uh, prior to the case if you're worried you're going to do it in the wrong order. And then that way you sort of uh, don't have to double back. Um, Always place your trocars before the eye is open. So placing pars planar trocars, which is very helpful, uh, uh, depending on what we're doing, if we're going to use a pars planar approach, they take a lot of force. So you don't want to have an open eye uh, when, you're, when you're placing them. And on that note, you always want to maintain a closed system whenever possible. Um, and then, uh, and that to me also includes scleral tunnels, which is an incision I really didn't use much until maybe a few, maybe say three or four, Four years ago I started using and although it takes a minute longer to create it, it it really 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 is a super stable incision and it makes your life way easier um, 
Again, always do DSEC in very complex size. I use the word very complex. So, you know, we, we are pushing the boundaries of what needs to be a DMEC and we add, you know, we can do DMECs in trabs and in tubes and then vitrectomize too. But, you know, I think we have to push the boundary uh, use when you're really, really, really complex. I think DSEC is the way to go. And it's not from the complexity of surgery of a DMEC. I think that most of us are good enough surgeons that we can do a DMEC in almost any eye, but it's, um, it's in the adherence. And, you know, a DMEC, I, you know, I've, I've seen DSECs bar barely floating uh, the next day, especially when you have a, a big pupil and the vitrectomized eye, the air does not want to stay. Uh, at least with a DSEC, you can rebubble it. In a DMEC, uh, if the graft is gone, it's gone. So for that reason, I, I do, I really do use DSEC in the very complex eyes. I always use a safety suture for every DSEC I do, and that's because every DSEC I do is pretty complex. And this way I can rebubble to, you know, all day, every day, and I never have to worry about going back to the OR with the patient. Um, always consider an iris repair. So if you have a big dilated pupil, uh, that's, that's more likely the air bubble is going to go right back the second they sit up. Um, so again, consider repairing it. Uh, and I always use a scleral sutured IOL when I've got a fakia that will be corrected open sky. So now that we sort of have the, the rules, you're going to ask, you know, why, why are the rules what they are? And it's because there are really three classic situations when it comes to what I'm going to say complex anterior segment surgery combined with transplants. And these are the three cases that come in very often and they really get broken. I'd say all of them can be broken into these three cases, which is one, a PBK with an ACIOL. So this by definition means there's a lens in the eye. It in a bad position, the posterior chamber, sorry, the posterior capsule is not intact. There's often vitreous, and often your view is very poor. Uh, ABK is is by definition the same as the above, but no lens present. And then, uh, and I really will lump those two together because I treat them the same way. Um, and then lastly is uh, the scarred traumatized cornea with aphakia plus or minus aniridia. These almost always come in after a trauma, corneal edema, laceration, uh, poor shape, transparency, and then uh, they're often aphakic with vitreous and a poor view. So if I break these up, I sort of start to get patterns of how I treat them. So this is, this is really my approach. So in the first, the PBK with an ACIOL in place, I generally do a DSEC here. I do a pars plana approach to vitrectomy. I do an IOL exchange with the Yamane intrastural haptic fixation uh, lens. I do it through a scleral tunnel. I may use Gonio to uh, better visualize the haptics. And I think it's really important preoperatively to Gonio these patients to see if the haptics are fibrosed in. And if, they, if you have enough view, uh, that re will help you. Uh, if not, you do test it in the operating room, of course, but it's good to know. Um, and then often a pupiloplasty and often a superficial keratectomy as well for the view. Uh, the second group, like I said, I'm just going to uh, lump it in with the first. It's basically the same surgery. The only difference is you can usually go through a small incision because you don't need to take a large uh, non-foldable ACIOL out. And then the third, uh, because you are doing a PK that's going to be open sky, uh, I do a scleral sutured uh, IOL, uh, often a mortar and iridia IOL, so you can uh, reduce that photophobia. And I, uh, in this case, I will use Gore-Tex and scleral sutural. So now, review. If you don't have a capsule, these are the options. AC IOL, I do everything in my power to avoid. Iris claw lenses, if you're going to use these, the retropupillary position um, is definitely uh, preferable. You can suture an IOL to the iris. I don't love things attached to the iris. I think that the risk of CME is, is much higher. And then especially with the graft, you're, you're increasing the risk of inflammation, so risk of rejection. But I know uh, some people have had great results with these. Scleral sutured lenses, so Gore-Tex, currently the scleral melting technique. Uh, Canabrera has been describing that, and I know um, I know that's sort of been popularized as well by uh, Kathleen McCabe. So some some good technique there, um, and then intrascleral haptic fixation. So previous was the um, the Sherioff and slash Agarwal uh, flaps and pockets, what we call the glued wide IOL, but a glue really not glued, and the and the double needle flange double needle, which is the Amani technique. Um, so in my opinion, there really are two real options, which is scleral sutured PCIOL 
or Yamane technique. And uh, I am biased, um, and I know other people have good results with others, but this is really when I'm doing it the way I sort of like to approach it. So that means we have two new rules. When you're doing a Yamane, you want to have an, you, sorry, if you have a closed system, perform the Yamane. Now, people have described doing, performing a Yamane in an open system, so PK Yamane, and it's doable. And in case anyone watching does decide they want to try it, the key is you need to do your needle passes while you have a closed system. So before you, before you open the trephination of the eye, you would pass your needles then you would op uh, you would partially open your trephination and you would thread them. And this is the easiest Yamane you'll ever do because it's very easy to thread. And then you'll pull the, the haptics out. Uh, and I would recommend melting them at that point uh, because you are going to have a big change in the scleral shape as, the, as, you, as you go completely open sky and the haptic can slip in. Um, and then and then you can uh, suture it. And that's a great way to do Yamane, except you have to do it open sky. Uh, so you have to pass the needles first because it, with, a, with a floppy open eye, you will never be able to pass the needles. Um, and the downside is that you do have the needles partially in the eye and you will let go of both of them. And, uh, and then you will allow the sclera to collapse a little. So of course you wanna use a flaringering here, but there is a risk that the needle the needle ends could touch retina and, and if it or cause a retinal detachment, the retinal tear detachment. So that's, that's I, I avoid that, but certainly people have described that. And so if I do have an open system, that's when I go with a scleral sutured eye well, because I know I can pre-place, pre-plan a lot of what I'm going to do beforehand. And in doing so, have minimal open sky time, which is always my goal. And now that we do less and less and less open sky surgery, I think it's really important to be open sky for a short a period of as time. So group one, PBK with an ACIOL. So I, as I mentioned, I always block, I use a sub tenons, that's my preference. It's just, I don't love uh, retrobulbers, but I know retrobulbers are, are very good. And by all means, uh, feel free to use them if that's your preference. But if you don't like performing retrobulbers, I think that a sub tenons is honestly almost as good. And it's a very, very simple thing to do. So I recommend no matter what you do, you have to block them because um, I didn't realize how mean I was. And I did a couple without blocking patients because I've done everything under topical my, my whole career and uh, realized very quickly how, um, how tender this can be. So always block. Uh, superficial keratectomy, I think that, you know, anytime you need to see what you're doing inside an eye with edema, take off the epithelium. Um, if, if nothing more, it probably helps with healing. It probably, there's less boggy tissue that your new transplant needs to detergest marking is 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 key and so what I when I mark an eye um, I make sure that I'm 180 degrees apart exactly so I use a toric marker as, as seen here um, and uh, you can use um, a cannula anything straight but I like the toric marker because I can center it I can know that I can look through here and say that I'm center on the cornea and I have nice dents on the limbus here that I can then use and then what I'll do is then I'll go from the limbus approximately two, not approximately, exactly two millimeters back using a, um, a set of calipers that have been marked so that I know exactly where my, my uh, needles are going to go. So centration in Yamane is critical and it has 100% to do with your marking. So 180 degrees apart exactly. Distance from the limbus is exactly the same on both sides. And then the key here is once you have a dot on your sclera that you know you're going to go through, you have to, you have to decide if this is where you're going to start your tunnel or if this is where your tunnel is going to end and that's when you're going to take your needle and sort of turn and dive sort of towards the optic nerve and that's where the inner ostium of your scleral tunnel is going to be because your scleral tunnel is going to have an external ostium which is around where you're going to see the bulb and an inner ostium which is actually where the haptic enters the eye. And as you can imagine, the, you have to make sure that it's the same on both sides. So you pick one, whether it be you start here or you end here, um, but you have to make sure it's the same. The length has to be the same too. So if you're going to end here, some people will mark 1.5 uh, just in the direction that they're going to go so they know where to start. Um, if your length on one side is 1.5 and your length on the other is 3, 
then the inner ostia are, are not going to be exactly 180 apart. And then you're going to have decentration and you're going to wonder why. And it's because the length of the tunnels are different. And on to, as well as length, you need to actually be the same in X, Y, and Z. So it's the length, but it's also, if one tunnel is, is shooting towards the limbus and the other is going way posterior, again, you're not going to have equal inner ostia. So you really want to make sure you're lined up. And so you want to go really tangential to the limbus. Some people talk about five degrees. I go straight tangential. And, um, and, and that's really what's going to help. Now, the one like super pearl, if I could give you, is the reason your lengths of your tunnels can often be different is because the way when you're making a cataract incision in a really soft eye, you look and you see that your incision is way longer than you wanted. Um, soft eyes tend to uh, produce long incisions. And for that reason, you have to have a pressurized eye and you want to make sure the pressure is the same when you do both passes so that you have the same intrascleral path or length. And that really helps getting the same inner ostia, which will then help with centration. So these are all sort of, you know, simple things. And I always joke because I tell the residents, you know, I, I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm 15 minutes into the surgery and I say, I haven't done anything yet because all I'm doing is, is measuring. Next comes trocars. So the trocars, uh, these, this, is, uh, this is an Alcon uh, 23 gauge uh, trocar set, valved trocars, I like valve trocars. Um, if you look at the other side of the trocar, which you can't see, there's actually dots and it shows you how far back you are. So there's a three, uh, three and four or 3.5 and four. Anyways, I always aim for about 375 posterior to the limbus. You know, obviously there's no lens here, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and I, but I also like to make sure that the trocars are in places that make sense to me. So I'm operating temporal. So this trocar is placed in this case, just forget if it's temporal or not. It is where my right hand is because this trocar is for vitrectomy. So I want to make sure I can vitrectomize properly. I will put a second trocar and the second trocar is going to be over here. And that's because the second trocar is for infusion. So I want it out of the way and I don't want it interfering with my Yamane. I don't want it getting in the way of anything. And that's another great thing to doing pars plana infusion is you don't have an AC maintainer getting in the way of things. So trocars are placed in a beveled fashion. So you go pretty much uh, 45 degrees until you get to uh, about here, which is where the actual trocar starts. All of this is just laid. Then you turn it to the optic nerve and push. It, it can use a little bit of force sometimes. Um, and you're doing this beveled and then turning path so that when you take the trocars out later, they're self-sealing, uh, which is especially important if you're doing a DSEC because you, you need to have uh, a formed AC. Uh, so you don't want leakage from the posterior segment. Um, by putting your, your, your trocars posteriorly, um, you are going to do your vitrectomy from the posterior segment as well. And this allows you to do everything from where it anatomically is. The retina guys don't do anterior vitrectomies because it doesn't make any sense. Vitreous is coming from the back and moving its way forward. So instead of just pulling it forward, go back and pull it back. Uh, and this also allows you to clear a good area uh, behind the pupil, your working distance, so things don't get uh, caught up. Because the last thing you want to do is tangle your IOL, where there's a lot of IOL work on the pupillary plane here, uh, tangle it in vitreous. So that's the key here to reduce the risk of renal detachment or tear, you do a pars plane of vitrectomy. So people that are afraid of pars plane of vitrectomy is because it has a risk of uh, renal tear attachment. It absolutely does. But if you do this without one, I think your risk is higher. And uh, obviously this is a terrible view through this cornea. But what I generally do is I tell the retina guys um, that I want them to look at them after the surgery uh, when the view is better and they look to make sure there's no tears in the periphery. Anyone that's very comfortable at looking at the periphery, by all means, you can do it yourself. Um, six years after after residency or fellowship, I'm not the best at square all the pressing anymore. I'm okay at it. I'd rather a retina person clear them. So <clears throat> now, scleral tunnels. So I always use a scleral, I, I now I create my peritomy. I use a little bit of cautery. Remember, we don't want ischemic uh, fra. And I do a partial thickness frown groove, uh, about five, 350 to 500 microns. And then I carry that partial groove into clear cornea and I extend it so it's about six millimeters um, and I don't enter the eye yet. I then create two pairs of I perform my pars plane of vitrectomy. Um, 
Now, when um, remember, when you are doing a parse plane of vitrectomy, you do not, it's not a lightsaber that you're swinging around. You do your vitrectomy in a spot and then you move. You don't want to be pulling and moving at the same time. That's how you get vitreous traction. Um, now, whenever uh, we mentioned I like to gonio these patients before I do uh, anything, the reason is I want to know if the haptics have been fibrosed into the angle. So if I haven't been able to, or even if I have, I always test the haptics because the last thing you want to do is open up the eye, grab the lens and realize it's not going anywhere. So what I do is I always test the haptics with a Sinsky or a Kuglin hook. And I just push on them and I just make sure that the, the, the IOL is completely free from the angle before I'm going to do anything. Um, now you can use intraoperative gonioscopy uh, to, to free them up, which uh, I think I, the video I'm showing will show that as well. <clears throat> once you have open, once you've, uh, ooh, let's go back here. So um, once you bring the lens, the new lens onto the field, and you can see there's two different lenses here. This is an MA60, which I would not recommend for this procedure. Um, and this is a Zeiss CT Lucia 602, which I would highly recommend for this procedure. Always test the haptics into the lumen of the needles you're going to use beforehand. The last thing you want to do is, is find out they don't fit intraoperatively. So with the Zeiss uh, lens, I know it'll fit in the TSK, but sometimes you just have an, an odd needle or an odd haptic. So I always test. Um, testing outside of the eye is very easy. Um, when we didn't have the CT Lucia, um, I, I often I would actually use a 27 gauge needle. So again, I would test it. And sometimes um, uh, you find one that just doesn't fit properly for whatever reason. It's just an anomalous needle or, uh, or haptic. So it's always best to test outside of the eye. The TSK thin walled needles uh, have an outer diameter of 30 and an inner diameter of 27, which is why they're nice. These are actually meant for fillers, like in dermatology. So when they're trying to inject in the smallest uh, hole possible viscous things, um, that's why they have this thin wall. So that's that's the, the story behind it. The nice thing is in a, uh, you have a tighter uh, squish from the, of the uh, sclera around the haptic. So it, it's easier to uh, prevent it from falling back. Honestly, these lenses will not fall back. Uh, this, is the, this is the TSK uh, packaging in case you're interested. What I then do is I open up my scleral tunnel. I take out the ACI well and I put the lens in just like this. Um, there's no reason to fold it if you're taking it out an ACI well, you have a six millimeter uh, incision. And the nice thing is, if you have a scleral tunnel, that the AC isn't collapsing, it, it's, it's self-sealing. Um, so that's the real, the, the nice thing about that incision. I always have the distal, uh, the leading haptic uh, sitting above the iris, and the trailing haptic comes out of the wound, so it's nice and secure. Then I suture half of this closed to gain control of the AC, the AC again. And then I do my needle passes. So first pass, docking the first, second pass, docking the second. And then the second, people will talk about it being very difficult to dock the trailing haptic. And that's not true. It's mildly challenging occasionally. So the key, and this was from, this is a pearl that Steve Safran taught me that I find very helpful, is when you're docking your second, uh, when you want to dock your second needle, the issue is you've got your first haptic and it is docked in a needle, which is sort of hanging over here. You have your second haptic coming out of your main incision, which is uh, either a small incision or it's a half sutured now. And, uh, and you want to really bring it into the eye. And you, only, you really don't have enough hands because you want to make your needle pass. And then you want to uh, grab the haptic. If you grab the haptic and, and bring it into the eye, it's then very difficult to make your needle pass. So with the firm... Uh, Ah, you make your needle pass and then what you do is you take your needle and you gently push on the optic. You already have your MST through your paracentesis and it's on the inner ostium of your in main incision. So what's happening is your MST is here, mouth open, right here ready to go. And as you push with the needle, that brings this haptic in. And then what you do is you just grab it when it's the appropriate length that you want and then just using this you bring the whole thing in and then dock and that really simplifies this procedure so that was a great pearl that um, Steve Safran gave me 
always remove the needles concurrently. I've done some times where I haven't. Um, and I think that actually the video I show is, is interesting because I don't, but you, you really want to bring them out concurrently at the same time. Always test for centration. If you have poor centration, which may happen, that's okay. What you really want to do is you want to pick the better haptic and you, and then create a flange on that tip. And then what you're actually going to do is you're going to bring the other haptic back into the eye, repass the needle and redock it. And uh, you can redock. And, uh, and again, Steve Safran, who's probably done more of these than Yamane himself, says that he redocks about a third of the time still because he really wants good centration. You melt the haptics once they're out. Um, so these are, these. this is a low temp cautery, but you can use high temp cautery. The key is if you're using high temp cautery, you're farther. You never touch it with regardless of what type of cautery you're using. You always heat it up, bring it close and allow it to form this little flange, this mushroom flange. And if you can see, it's sort of rounded like a dome here and then square here, which is the perfect uh, flange because it will not enter the eye and yet it'll be soft it, on the, on the sclera and it won't erode through the sclera and conjunctiva. So that's really the key to these. And th this is, this has to do with the PVDF haptics. So the, you know, the other lenses melt more into a, a cone, which means they're sharper on the edge of the sclera and conjunctiva and also technically could go in, which they won't though. Um, once I've done this, I, I start my decimetorexis. Remember not to let pieces fall into the vitreous because we've got a vitrectomized eye. I always use a pull through technique, safety suture, air management is key in these cases. And then I remove the trocar. So that's, that's really the, this case. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a video, um, but here you see there's an ACIOL. So the first thing I'm gonna do is mark. And uh, then I'm marking two millimeters back. I'm going to use my trocars, uh, and you see there's really, it's tangential at first, and then you aim towards the optic nerve. You see there's a little bit of force there. You can just pull out, but having something there helps. Uh, here we're going to create a pyridomy that's about six millimeters. This is the guarded diamond blade set at about 500 microns. I carry this forward with a uh, crescent blade, and this is, this is how I'm going to get a nice self-sealing wound. Of course, I'm going to suture it, but you don't have to. See here, I'm testing the haptics and they are fibrosed in, they are locked in. So I'm actually using intraoperative gonio to show that. And then now, just so you know, disclaimer, these are not meant for that. But you see here, you can pull it out because I pulled it out through the cocoon because I cut it and then I grabbed it from the large side, from the large end, that bulb of the haptic, which is, uh, which is makes this much easier. Otherwise, you're forced to leave those op those haptics in there. And this is the nice thing about this gonio lens, which is not the usual direct gonio lens. This is uh, one that Ike has uh, has created, so that you can see proximal. You can't. You don't only see distal like you do with the other gonio lenses. Um, so that allows you to actually remove both haptics. So here we're going to do a good um, vitrectomy. Look what you find sometimes. You find all kinds of things. So that's a chunk of basically calcified um, Sommering's ring, and that can cause chronic CME. So it's nice to get that junk out of there. Uh, so here I am. Close. I've taken out the ACI well. I'm just. I've put in the new lens. I'm just closing that incision a little bit. I used uh, iris hooks here mainly because the pupil was very small. Um, but generally, I don't. I don't use anything. Here you'll see me docking. It really isn't very difficult. I'm. I'm serious. Um, so doc. Now, in this case, I actually did one and then another because this was a case I was trying to learn that to see if it was better and it wasn't. I don't do that anymore. See, there's a big iris defect, so I figure we should repair that while we're in the eye. Um, you know, that's going to cause problems with your, um, with your bubble for your desect. So we close that up nicely. I think it took maybe two sutures to close that, and then you get a much better uh, repair. This is my suture pull-through technique. I, this, is a, uh, this is a 9 but you can use 10 as well proline suture on a long curve needle such as a CTC6 or a CIF4 um, and uh, what I do here is I take it and I put these sutures through the lumen of the of the um, the abuse and glide now this one this glide as you can see this is actually a defect this shouldn't actually they should touch but because it doesn't it actually lets me just push the suture through there. But if, if it was the other one that we have and this did touch, you just slide it right through the lumen, then you go through the lumen and you grab the, the ends on the other side. 
but you have to make sure that these go through, of course. And then all I'll do is I will, uh, I will pass these sutures through and these sutures will both introduce the graft and I'll tie them as a safety suture. Um, so this is sort of been the technique that I've adopted for these because it's really easy to have a graft go posteriorly when you're use, doing very complex eyes. Um, that's also part of the reason it's a good idea to, um, to fix the pupils. But you see here, always sweep back and forth when you use a needle through a corneal wound because you can catch corneal stromal fibers and that can, uh, and that can obviously suture whatever you're doing to the cornea. Um, and so you see sweeping back and forth and taking to make sure that these do not cross in the eye. You have to make sure they don't. And always have your infusion on when you're pulling these. These things want to pop around, so you want to make sure that the AC is formed. So now I just grab both of the sutures at the same time and pull the graft in. And then it has, it has brought the graft into the eye. It's positioned it. That graft is going nowhere. I have all the time in the world to do whatever I want now. And, uh, and so that's why I, I love this technique. And then I'll tie it, and then I can use that, I can use that suture as a safety suture, so I know that even if they did, the graft attaches in the uh, in post-operative period, I can just rebubble it um, at the slit lamp. So I do tie that one because I use a nino. I, I actually just leave it uh, on the surface. I don't bury it. But I, you know, patients like this with a superficial peritectomy and all that are going to need a BCL anyway, so it doesn't really make a difference. But basically, you close up your wound, close up your conjunctiva, full anterior chamber uh, fill, and. Uh, and that's that. So that's sort of, that is the summary of sort of surgery number one. Um, basically, uh, when you have a ACIOL and you're going to do a DSEP. And now this is surgery number two. It's a shorter surgery. Um, and this is when you have your scarred, traumatized cornea with a fakia and or aniridia. So you see this poor, very nice gentleman had RK. Uh, and a uh, had a trauma and it split his RK open. He lost his lens, he lost his iris. So again, I always block, but you always wanna make sure you don't have chemosis because anytime you're marking your conjunctiva, if you have chemosis, it makes for a mess. Um, if you have a young patient, you might wanna consider GA. Uh, just a thought, I haven't uh, yet, but just a thought. Now you wanna do, now because we're going to do scleral suturing here, Start by making your pyridomies first, and you want to have them 180 degrees away, and you want to have light cautery as needed. You don't want blood everywhere. Once you do that, I measure two millimeters posterior to the limbus, and I make an approximately three and a half to four millimeter partial thickness groove. You do not want your groove too short. You want to have some length. This is where your suture is going to come out, and you don't want it to be a real small, tiny loop. Um, now, these this is really just partial thickness, not 500 microns. It's like 100 or two, you just want that suture to lay in the base of it. Um, and then at the ends of it, of the uh, your two passes, you're gonna make your full thickness sclerotomies. You can use an MVR blade. I use the diamond, I just only go in a little bit. Um, this is an ab, inter, uh, ab externo approach. This is my, my, uh, my favorite approach. Uh, then you place your flaringa in. So, so again, you have to have the order. Um, then you do your partial thickness corneal trephination. And what you'll start to do is you will open two 1.5 millimeter areas. And this is your working area. So I like to open here and here. And now I'm gonna do an anterior vitrectomy still in a closed system. So yes, you can do an open sky vitrectomy, but my thought is anything open sky is better closed sky if you can. So I'd like to do a closed sky vitrectomy. And then, uh, and then I'll bring my IO, once this is nice and clean, I'll bring my IOL into the surgical field. You can see this is a Mortar 67B um, with the uh, aniridia ring and the uh, 3.5 millimeter optic. Um, then I like to use a CV8 Gore-Tex. Uh, you, you know, they're, you know for, for what it's worth, this is never gonna break. Your biggest risk is erosion, so you have to be careful. That's why we're gonna, I'll show you how exactly to use the Gore-Tex, but uh, the, the Gore-Tex is the way to go. Uh, ne I would never use tenoproline. Uh, some people use ninoproline. Uh, the, one of the keys there is if you do, you never pass it through the eyelet. You always do like a girth hitch, technically, or a cow hitch, as people call it, um, so that it's on the, the actual haptic itself because here you're going to get chafe and that's how you're going to break an, a proline suture. With Gore-Tex you can go right through it because it's never going to it's never going to break. Uh, if you, you can use radial 
or horizontal groups. So radial groups, so I've made horizontal groups. I go back and forth, um, but uh, if you were to do a radial groove, then the groove is this way. Um, if you do horizontal, you have to make sure you do what's called an anti-torque technique. So if you look here, both sutures come out above the haptic, and here they come out above the haptic. Um, sometimes people have one come in, and that's because I've gone in, but then I've come out on the same side, both above the haptic, same here. If you don't do that and you have one coming out above and one coming out below, that's okay as long as they're on opposite sides. And the next slide will show that, but we're gonna get, we're gonna get to that right now. So here, this is from Dino Wano, very, very uh, vocal on Karanet, who's an amazing teacher and has great pictures for everything and big uh, macro models. So if you look here, imagine uh, this was our lens that we're going to, that we're going to suture in. As you can see, both of these are under and both of these are over. So this would be the equivalent of holding your phone this way and you're going to get tilt, it tilts, it's gonna flip. Whereas here, you have on this side over and this side under, so then here this side under, this side over. That'd be the equivalent of holding your phone this way and you're gonna have an anti-torque configuration and no tilt. So that's the key when you're doing scleral suturing of an IOL, if you're gonna do horizontal grooves. Um, if you are losing proline, you can't pass it through the, the, the eyelid, like I was saying, so you would do something like this. So now that we've got everything set up, um, and this is sort of, this is actually just what I was saying. These are the configurations here. So once we've got everything set up, I, I still go through my small incision. So what I'll do is now, there's many ways to dock these. Some people you actually don't make a, an actual sclerotomy, but they use a 25 gauge needle, and then they keep the needles on the Gore-Tex, which they straighten out with not, not the usual uh, suture needles, that you, suture, uh, needle drivers that you use. You have to use the big heavy ortho ones, so you don't destroy the delicate ophthalmology ones, and you can actually dock one and the other. Uh, what I've actually moved to doing is I just cut the needles off and I use two MSTs. So this is a 25 gauge MST grasper, because that's the Snyder. This is a 23 gauge micro grasper. And I just bring the suture in, hand it off to the other one and I pull it out. So that's the technique I like to use. And so you just do it. The key is you have to make sure you're handing off the, the sutures in a way that does not cause twists. So this is what I call spaghetti management. So more than anything else, this is frustrating because you've got sutures everywhere and you just gotta have to be really careful. Make sure they don't get caught on the speculum or the drape. The last thing you wanna do is pull something accidentally and then have it come out. Um, so spaghetti management. Uh, once I have all four sutures ready to go, then I actually do my trephination. So this is all closed system still. So even though it's a PK and we could have done everything open sky, we've done everything closed sky. And it's us a much uh, more stable eye. And more importantly, in these eyes that are traumatized, um, you know, they're at risk of suprachoroidal hemorrhage. This is by definition, their second or third, third surgery usually um, at least. So this, this, is, uh, this is my preference. So then I open it up. Um, I then insert the uh, IOL, and then I finish my trephination. Uh, if this was a, a Alcon CZ7DBD, uh, you don't need as big an opening. This is a massive, massive IOL. And so you actually, even here, because this is bigger than eight, you could not, so you know, as our trephinations are usually approximately eight, you can't just trephine and push this in. This will fish mouth it has to fish mouth. So it always looks a little not great, but that's what you have to do based on the size of this um, IOL, which is huge. So I push it in, gently pull the sutures, and then I finish my trephination. Once my trephination is finished, I place OVD over everything and I begin suturing the uh, PK. So I've not tied, just you know, friction alone is enough to keep these uh, here. They're not going anywhere. And then once I've done either eight or 16, it depends on the day, um, how I'm feeling, what we're doing, I will, then, I will then tie. So what I like to do is you can either do a sliding knot, which I, I don't, sliding knots are great, I just don't think they're necessary here. Or what you can do is you can throw down a triple throw 
and then throw down a triple throw on the other side and then move back and forth for centration before you then go to the first one and lock it and the second one and lock it. So I don't use sliding knots here. I just do uh, one throw at a time on both sides. And then once it's good, I lock it in place. Um, now the, you really want to, you really want to make sure that the, um, you know, both are on the same side of the flaringa ring, obviously, but you know, just a reminder, um, make sure it's nice and centered. And then when you tie these, tie them right over the, the side of the sclerotomy, because these are large knots and you have to bury them or they will erode through the conjunctiva. And I've even seen them eroded through the sclera when they weren't completely buried, when they were just like intrascleral. So you really, really, really need to bury these knots and you don't pull it um, like a normal, say, 10 nylon to bury it the way you normally would. You actually feed it into the hole, into the sclerotomy using either MSTs or one of the tines of a curved tire. Um, and that's that's sort of a key. I actually find burying these knots is probably the most uh, annoying part of this whole surgery. So then once everything's ready, sew everything up, take off the flaringa ring, close up your conjunctiva, and uh, and sort of leave your eye like this. So uh, to summarize, so those are the two types of surgeries that I think are, you know, really uh, you can you can sort of lump so many if not all of your complex anterior segment surgeries into some modification or variation of those two and uh so i've always thought you know that that if you can if you can sort of have a good uh a good plan and always know the order you, you seem to do things quicker these can be longer surgeries and, and you stay out of trouble so my pearls are i always measure first i always block you want them happy Flaringa ring if vitrectomy, pyridomies before your flaringa ring, trocars before the eyes open. Always try to keep a closed system when possible. Desec in the very complex eyes, safety suture in your desec, and almost always use a scleral sutured IOL when you're correcting aphakia in an open sky situation. So uh, thanks very much, guys. That that's uh, that's my talk, and I'm happy to to go over some some uh, questions. All right, thank you very much, Josh. I think um, when people see these kinds of pictures and videos, they're like, wow, this is pretty crazy and intense stuff, which it is. But I think, as you said, as you break it down to the, the, the component steps, it becomes a lot more manageable. And I guess some of the guiding principles that you mentioned are very key, um, and I guess would help the, the beginning surgeon for sure. Um, a question I had for you is we, you know, we, we've learned a lot about the Yamani uh, intrascleral uh, haptic fixation technique. Um, what are your thoughts about some of the devices that are out that help you pre-place the, um, or actually, you, know, you can actually place it on the eye and then it guides the 30 gauge needle into the eye. What are your thoughts yes. about that? Yeah, great question. So that's the, the Gooder is the one of the main ones that I think um, maybe Brandon Ayers helped, uh, one of the people was talking about them, uh, that has the, exactly, it has the needle placements exactly 180 degrees away and the right tangential and you basically just feed it through it. Um, I've seen them, I don't have personal experience with them so I can't comment, but um, uh, I mean, they make sense to me, but I have to say that marking has, um, I haven't found it, can I, put it? I haven't found that that would probably be necessary, but it does, it does make good sense. It does. I just haven't used them. I haven't found them to be necessary. Okay. And um, when you are using your uh, DSEC pull-through technique, uh, can you comment on how you manage your, your so at, when you pass the purling through the graft, where does uh, needle end A and needle end B go through these. Yes, got it, perfect. Yeah, so that's that's a great, uh, great question. So um, when, what I do, and this, hopefully I can, um, I can sort of describe it in words, uh, maybe with some hand motions, but, um, so the graph starts off, as we know, it starts off endothelium side up on top of its cap, right? So it's upside down. Um, what I do is I do a full thickness pass of the needle, through about half a millimeter from the end of the disc, okay? And then I look at the two ends and I always say, this one's coming from the top and this one's coming from the bottom or whatever. I then put the graft onto the Bucin glide, 
I thread the two needles through it and I flip it. So I then say, this one's now coming from the top, this one's coming from the bottom. We know that we want, I like to make a loop. So I don't just have them exit in the periphery. Um, I actually make a loop. So if you think about it, the, the graft, once it's been flipped, so it's proper orientation, the, the suture end coming up top and the bottom. The one coming from the bottom has to actually be the one that's going to go out and far. So the one coming from the bottom, I always place first and then I go right out near the limbus and get it just out of the eye, way away from everything. The second suture pass is the most important one because it is exiting from the, from the superior surface of the graft that is going to be against the stroma. Wherever you pass this suture is where the graft is going to be. So the other one, because it doesn't go, it, it's coming down, it's going to go underneath. But this one from up top is going to anchor it wherever it is. So this one, I always, it has to obviously be more central than the other one, which is just way out through the limbus. And I look at how far my bite was from the edge of the graft. So if my bite was about half a millimeter into the graft, then I think in my head, if this is an eight millimeter graft and it's a 12 millimeter cornea, where exactly do I want to place this so that that lines up? Um, so that's sort of, that's sort of how I, I pre-plan it in my head. And then that's how I make the passes. The one thing to remember, of course, too, is it's not where the suture needle comes out of the epithelium once you've gone full thickness. It's where it enters the stroma that is where this, uh, where the disc is going to be. So um, it, it, it does, um, it does take a little, to be honest, I don't know what to say other than practice. Um, and the other thing is uh, if you have a very, poorly placed one, it will be very decentered, And so you really want to do what you can to plan it properly first. There have been ones that have been so decentered. I actually, I've never had one so decentered, but in my mind, I've always thought to myself, if I had one that was so decentered, what would I do? Um, and the truth is, if I couldn't use something, say, if I had to um, either a bent 30 gauge or a reverse Sinsky to move the graft into the position. If the, if the suture is just, you know, it's there, it's not going to let it move. Every time you do something, it just jumps back to where it does, which is what happens often in these. I would probably consider cutting it, bringing the graft into where I want it to be, and then use the 10 nylon and do a full a through and through suture the way that um, you, I mean, the way I've seen you do safety sutures in the past, once you've, once you know, uh, you've introduced it, say with the Busen glide and the Busen forceps, you get it into a good position, you do your air fill, and then you pass your suture that way. So if it was really decentered, I would, I would cut it, get it where I want, and then, uh, and then do the 10 nylon like that. But uh, thankfully I've not had one uh, terribly decentered. Yeah. And then again, going back to the Yamani uh, technique, um, how, how differently do you approach the vitrectomy component, given that there's going to be such an intimate relationship between the haptic and the, um, you know, the, the unfor uh, kind of unseen area behind the iris root? Yes, yes. So, so very, yeah, I, I am I, a very thorough vitrectomy. So what I do is I go in, and I start off by doing, a, if first of all, I start off with the vitrector, you know, port up centered in the pupil where I can see it and I start eating. And the goal, the first thing I want to do is if I have any vit in the AC, I want to bring it all down and first clear out my AC. Once I've done that, I really kind of go in a bit of a circle, clear out the core vit behind the pupil. And then I move and I, I will often use a Kuglin hook in one hand because you have infusion in, in your pars in a port. So you have pars plane infusion. Your only hand that you're using right now is on the vitrector. So I'll put, take a Kuglin through a par uh, paracentesis and I'll really pull the iris out so I can see everything. And I will go around 360. I'll do a very thorough uh, vitrectomy behind the iris. Um, and the way I think of it is this. Um, if, if your cornea goes like this, so your iris is here. And then of course, there's still manipulation all the way out to where the haptics are going to be. So if you imagine two millimeters back, you're now sort of under sclera. So I, in my mind, think that everything in that area and posterior to it, like a bit of a tube or a cylinder to about, I think probably five to, I mean, if you think about an IOL, it, I mean, if not that you're dangling it like this, it'd be like 13 millimeters, you're not, but imagine, 
that working space is probably six, maybe seven millimeters. Um, everything in that column, I want to make sure that I've removed the vitrectomy for uh, the vitreous from thoroughly. So it is a very thorough uh, vitrectomy. I call it a it's a core and peripheral uh, vitrectomy in that area, so that you so you don't um, induce vitreous traction when you when you do it. So yeah, absolutely. And it's it, it's I take my time and I, I move slowly, of course, and I really clean that area out. Okay. And we have some um, techs and optometrists who see some of the post ops. So what pearls would you offer to them in terms of assessing our, our, our transplant patients, our PK patients, DSA complex, uh, anterior segment cases in the early post-op period? Sure. So early post-op, I mean, uh, you know, the bigger, you know, I, these are all big surgeries, you know, they, they, they don't look, they don't look like cataracts post-op day one where they're 20-20 uh, and loving you. I mean, there's often, you know, the, the graft needs to deterjest and their, their red eyes and they can be, uh, they can have a lot of inflammation, or they shouldn't, but they can have inflammation and the pressure spikes. So um, what I would probably suggest is, you know, you want to just look for, um, you want to gauge what is normal healing and it, these aren't cataracts, these are big surgeries. So it takes longer. Um, but it's first principles, you know, you should have uh, an intact wound that's not leaking. Always check wounds for leaks. You should have, you shouldn't have leaks in the areas of your haptics or your sclerotomies. Uh, if it's a PK, you shouldn't have a leak at the, at the incision. The, uh, the suture should be buried. They shouldn't be broken. Pressure should be, pressure can be very hard to measure in a fresh PK. Um, I really like the eye care. I actually think the eye care is a great instrument, but eye care, tonal pen, if everything fails, palpation. I mean, I can get within five millimeters of mercury. I'm not, I couldn't tell you if it was 17.6, but I can tell you it's, 10, 20, you know, 30, 40, 50, and I know, know that we're okay or we're soft. So really, you know, do what you can to get uh, a good pressure. Um, uh, Goldman on a, on, a, on a fresh PK, you know, if you have six diopters of cylinder day one, um, you know, you, you're going to say, oh, it's, you know, it's 16. And then you turn the Myers 90 and then all of a sudden it's 18 or 20 or 25. So uh, I always, on PKs, I always check the, um, the, the Goldman at 90 degrees and average them uh, if I don't have an eye care. Um, you know, significant pain is always a red flag. Uh, other than that, I'm, I don't know. I think those are the sort of the main things kind of, kind of falls back to basic principles, right? Wounds, pressure, pain, to some extent vision, but not really. Um, one of the most important things for your, your, D, your PK is there's no leak. DSEC is that it's attached. Um, if you think there's, uh, if you think it's detached, you want to rebubble. Um, DSECs are way more forgiving of detachment. So if you have a, you know, a slit detachment that covers 40% of your DSEC and it's inferiorly, that'll clear 100%. Um, DMEX, on the other hand, you know, more than 30% or center involved will rebubble the next day. And that's, uh, yeah. Then DMEC, of course, which we're not talking about, but those those can look pretty great the next day, but they don't always do. So, you know, you could have 2020 and amazing, or, you know, you can have uh, pretty poor for a number of weeks before they finally clear and look great. Yeah. And what do you do for CME prophylaxis for these cases? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually was just talking to my fellow about this. So, you know, nobody really talks about CME prophylaxis in transplants a lot. And in fact, the reason probably is we know we're going to keep all of these people on steroids forever or close to forever. Oh, and all of any complex transplant. So to me, if, if an eye is totally, totally normal and they've had a transplant, that's an eye that might be able to come off steroids. So that's KC or, you know, a DMEC in a, in a pseudofake. But glaucoma surgery, iris surgery, IOL uh, like exchanges, complex, they need to be on steroid forever, in my opinion. Um, so we know they're going to be on steroid, and they're going to be on a lot of steroids. So that's helping. But, you know, it's the NSAID. And as cornea people, we have a love-hate relationship with NSAIDs, right? Because we've all seen perforations and melts and terrible NSAID-related complications, not just generic, but branded good NSAIDs. We've all seen it in more likely in rheumatoid and stuff like that. But, um, but that's really our CME prophylaxis is NSAIDs. So I don't routinely use D, uh, NSAIDs in DMEC, um, but I've now had uh, two cases of CME. Uh, and, you know, I think to myself, maybe I should. I review the literature and the numbers, depending on what you read, are higher than P cataract. 
So the question is, why aren't we using it in everyone? Maybe you guys are, maybe I'm just slow to learn, but I just haven't. I've basically waited until I've seen CME. And, and you know, on that note, if I have a clear graph and they're not seeing better than 2040, I always get a macro CT. That's a, a pearl for sure. Like these, these eyes, um, not the most complex ones, but most transplants nowadays, they should definitely see better than 2040. So if they're not seeing 20, uh, better than 2040, they need a macro CT. Um, but yeah, so I don't use NSAIDs routinely in a transplant. Now in IOL exchanges, I use NSAIDs for three months uh, post-op. Um, now, if I've done a DSEC or a PK, I really, even though, you know, probably right away is probably the most important, I don't like the idea of doing a limbus to limbus superficial keratectomy. They've got a BCL on and then I pour on NSAIDs. So I know they're on steroids. I use steroids six times a day for the first week. So I know they're on a lot of steroid. I, I feel comfortable waiting until the epithelium is healed before I add an NSAID. Um, and so that, that's kind of my quick and dirty. If, if it's a real bad ocular surface and I'm doing a tarsorophy, I'll probably never put NSAIDs on it. Um, Faco DMEX, I use NSAIDs right off the bat on everyone. I guess it's kind of, I've, I guess I've sort of started with some patterns. So FACO DMEC gets NSAIDs, Iowa Exchange gets NSAIDs after, uh, right away, unless it's a transplant. If it's a transplant, I wait till the epithelium sealed. And PKs, I really haven't. Um, there's probably a bit of a role. I've never seen a PK like this get CME. But the other thing is, you know, if, if it's, let's say it's uh, 10%, I mean, eyes like this, I mean, yeah, we do them not infrequently, but you know, we don't have 50 eyes like that, that I can, you know, give you a good number for, right? Like if I do 10 of those PK, like big PKs like that with the Iowa exchange a year, that's a lot. Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks so much. It's been very enlightening. Thanks for the great kind of breakdown in terms of how uh, the approach should be and what principles we should think about. And um, I think it's been very useful. I'm gonna, I guess, as I mentioned to you before, have it on our YouTube channel, but thank you so much again for your time. It's good seeing you. Hope to see you soon in person. And uh, thanks again for all your all your work that you put into this. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And and just I'll take this two seconds to tell you this is a great you know lecture series. Congratulations to you for for putting this together. It's awesome, and it's a pleasure to be part of it. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Josh. Have a great evening. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye. -bye.